privilege of broadcasting over these free speech, no holes barred, truth to power airwaves. Stay tuned. KPFA, KPFB, Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno. Good evening. It's Thursday, May 9th. Donald Trump's defense attorney accuses Stormy Daniels of slowly altering the details of an alleged 2006 sexual encounter with Trump. Attorney Susan Nectulis strives to convince the jury in Trump's hush money trial in New York that a key prosecution witness cannot be believed. But Daniels gives as good as she gets in the exchanges. The United States warns Israel it will be dealing a strategic victory to Hamas if it carries out plans for an all-out assault on Rafah. The warning backed by a new threat from President Biden, who says he will pause more offensive military assistance to Israel if it goes through with the operation in a city where more than a million Palestinian civilians are sheltering. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says that the U.S. threat to withhold some arms will not prevent Israel from continuing its offensive, indicating he might proceed with an invasion of the packed city of Rafah against the wishes of his closest ally. Thousands of pro-Palestinian demonstrators protest in the Swedish port city of Malmö today against Israel's participation in the pan-continental pop competition Eurovision. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. calls on former President Trump to formally debate him during the upcoming Libertarian Party convention. Speaker Mike Johnson to keep his Speaker of the House job after the House votes to kill a motion to oust him in a dramatic showdown late yesterday that took less than an hour. And most PG&E customers to see their electric bills go up yet again under a new rate structure adopted today by the State Public Utilities Commission. From Pacifica Radio and the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Merkel. Former President Donald Trump's lawyers continued their attack on the credibility of Stormy Daniels for several hours today, with defense attorney Susan Netulis accusing the adult film star of making up the story of having sex with Trump. Today also saw failed attempts by the defense to get a mistrial declared and to get the judge, Juan Mershon, to loosen Trump's gag order in order to allow him to refute Daniel's testimony in public without having to run the danger of testifying himself under oath in the courtroom. Ed Donahue reports. Testimony has ended from Stormy Daniels in the New York hush money trial of former President Donald Trump. The defense tried to poke holes in Daniels' credibility, saying she had changed her story over the years about her 2006 sexual encounter with Donald Trump. It got heated. Daniels stood her ground. After leaving court, Trump said everyone saw what happened. I don't think we have to do any expl- explaining. I'm not allowed to anyway because this judge is corrupt. He's a corrupt judge. This judge, what he did... And what his ruling was is a disgrace. Judge Juan Mershon denied requests to modify the gag order so Trump could respond to Daniel's testimony and again denied a request from the defense to declare a mistrial over Daniel's testimony. And I got to get back on the campaign trail. I'm not supposed to be here. We are so innocent. The gag order bars the former president from speaking publicly about jurors, witnesses, and others connected to the case. I'm Ed Donahue. President Joe Biden was on the campaign trail in Wisconsin yesterday, touting plans for a new Microsoft data center there. Tonight, he's flying to the San Francisco Bay Area for a couple of fundraisers tomorrow. The trips come amid new polling data in the battleground states about what is on the minds of rural voters, with organizers noting some surprising results. Mike Moen has the story. The poll, released by the Rural Democracy Initiative, included feedback from Wisconsin voters. 
57 percent of respondents said they favored a more economic populist vision, with policies centered around lowering costs and raising incomes for the working class. Breakthrough campaigns researcher Patrick Toomey, who helped lead the poll, says that approach appears more popular than one often touted by GOP politicians. Just cutting taxes and getting rid of regulations is not going to do the most to to help me in this economy. And while economic policies aligned with Democrats, like minimum wage hikes, are favorable in this poll, many rural voters indicated they think Republicans are doing more for working people. Analysts say that shows Democrats have work to do to rebuild trust in rural areas. Meanwhile, three-quarters of respondents either support abortions or don't want the government interfering with decisions on reproductive health care. Toomey says it will take some time for Democrats to reconnect with these voters and that it won't completely turn around in this election cycle. But he suggests it's not completely hopeless for the party to make gains in rural America ahead of November's vote. One of the key learnings here is that there are enough voters in rural areas of battleground states who are up for grabs to determine the outcome of 2024. He suggests if Democrats are savvy with their outreach, they might be able to convince rural populations that they're pursuing policies these voters have outlined as a top priority. More than 1,700 voters in 10 states were part of the poll. As for Biden's appearance, it was at the same location as the failed Foxconn project announced by former President Donald Trump several years ago. This is Mike Moen for Wisconsin News Connection. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is calling on former President Trump to formally debate him during the upcoming Libertarian Party convention. Kennedy, an independent who considered joining the Libertarian Party after a failed primary bid as a Democrat, wants to take on Trump during the forum held later this month in Washington. Kennedy's pointing to data from Zogby, a polling and analytics firm, indicating that the environmental lawyer wins the election over Trump in a two-candidate race without factoring President Biden into the hypothetical matchup. Kennedy has put pressure on both Trump and Biden to debate him in recent weeks, hoping to raise his stature and get on more equal footing with the mainstream presumptive nominees. Reporter Ed Donahue has more. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is challenging Donald Trump to a head-to-head debate. In an open letter posted on X, formerly Twitter, Kennedy said the Libertarian Convention in Washington later this month provides a perfect neutral territory for he and Trump to have a debate where the former president can defend his record for his wavering supporters. Both are scheduled to appear at the convention separately. Trump wants to debate President Biden during the campaign, but has shied away from other rivals. In recent weeks, he has ramped up attacks against Kennedy. On social media, he called him a radical left liberal who's been put in place in order to help crooked Joe Biden. I'm Ed Donahue. The area of South Dakota, off limits to South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem, continues to grow as the Sisseton Wapaton Sioux tribe has become the fifth South Dakota tribe to ban the governor from their lands. That aligns them with the Cheyenne River Sioux, the Rosebud Sioux, the Oglala Lakota Sioux, and the Standing Rock Sioux tribes, each of whom have also banned Governor Nome from their lands. The Sisseton Sioux's decision to ban Nome was due to statements and actions by the governor that the tribe says are injurious to the parents of tribal children. The 13,000 square miles of South Dakota land held by these five tribal nations equates to 17 percent of South Dakota's total area. Simon Marks reports. It was a former U.S. president, Harry Truman, who once said, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. Well, the governor of South Dakota did get a dog, but her decision to shoot it dead may have just cost her the vice presidency of the United States. Governor Christy Nome is openly vying to become Donald Trump's running mate this November. And in her new autobiography, designed to boost her chances of being picked, she explains her decision to kill a puppy called Cricket that she claims was untrainable. Amid public uproar, she's now changed the story to suggest that Cricket was a threat to human life. At least that's what she told Fox News. It was a dog that was uh, extremely dangerous. I had a choice between keeping my small children and other people safe 
or a dangerous animal, and I chose the safety of my children. There is more. She also claims in her memoir to have met North Korean strongman Kim Jong-un, except she now concedes that meeting never occurred and is blaming her ghostwriter for that false claim. Influential Republicans like the former Speaker of the House of Representatives Newt Gingrich say there is now no possibility Governor Nome will become Donald Trump's running mate, and it was notable that she did not attend in person a fundraising event over the weekend at which the former president appeared to be assessing some figures on his vice presidential shortlist. I'm Simon Marks. Keeping his job after the House voted to kill a motion to oust him yesterday evening after a dramatic showdown that took less than an hour. Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene introduced a motion to vacate after threatening to move forward with trying to remove Johnson for several weeks, although the timing took lawmakers by surprise. Ed Donahue reports. The House overwhelmingly rejected an attempt to remove Mike Johnson as Speaker. Georgia Republican Marjorie Taylor Greene has been threatening to do this, declaring the office of Speaker to be vacant. The reaction? <laughs> Green read a long list of transgressions. She said Johnson had committed as speaker, calling him pathetic, weak, and unacceptable. When given a choice between advancing Republican priorities or allying with the Democrats to preserve his own personal power, Johnson regularly chooses to ally himself with Democrats. Majority Leader Steve Scalise quickly moved in to table Green's effort, essentially stopping it from going forward. Over the past several days, Mike Johnson has said he just has to do his job every day. It doesn't matter what political party you're in. You have to look at this. If you look at this objectively, you know, you know deep down that this is wrong. Democrats have backed Johnson, saying it's time to turn the page on GOP turmoil. Ed Donahue, Washington. Body camera video shows a Florida sheriff's deputy announced himself as law enforcement just before he fatally shot a black U.S. Air Force airman inside his own apartment in Fort Walton Beach in the state's Panhandle area. Okaloosa County Sheriff Eric Aiden presented the video hours after the family of senior airman Roger Fortson and their attorneys held a news conference in which they disputed that the deputy acted in self-defense. The sheriff disputed assertions made by civil rights attorney Ben Crump that the deputy had gone to the wrong apartment, covered the door's peephole, and did not announce himself. Crump noted that the officer did not tell Fortson to drop his gun before shooting him dead. Reporter Jennifer King with more. Over 450 children have lost their lives to gun violence in the U.S. this year. Kathy Barnett with Moms Demand Action predicts the new law won't enhance school safety. She notes the community. Senior Airman Roger Fortson, a 23-year-old black man, was home alone at his off-base apartment in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, on May 3rd, when deputies burst into the wrong unit and fatally shot him. That's according to a family attorney. In a statement, civil rights attorney Ben Crump says Fortson was on a FaceTime call with a woman at the time of the encounter. Crump says the woman said Fortson was not causing a disturbance when he heard a knock at the door. He asked who was there but didn't get a response and didn't see anyone through the peephole when he heard a louder knock a few minutes later. Crump says the woman said Fortson was concerned and went to retrieve his gun. The deputies burst through the door, saw that he was armed, and shot him six times. The woman said Fortson was on the ground saying, I can't breathe, after he was shot, according to Crump's statement. Okaloosa County Sheriff Eric Arden posted a statement expressing sadness about the shooting. Last week, the sheriff's office said the deputies reacted in self-defense after encountering an armed man. Fortson died at the hospital, according to officials. One of his roles was loading cannons for the AC-130J Ghost Rider. I'm Jennifer King. The fatal shooting of the U.S. Air Force airman at his off-base apartment in the Florida panhandle by a sheriff's deputy brings to mind other instances of black people being killed by law enforcement in their own homes as they're going about their day. Botham Jean, a 26-year-old black man, fatally shot in 2018 by a white police officer who mistook his Dallas apartment for her own. Amber Geiger was still in uniform when she walked up to Jean's apartment, which was on the fourth floor, directly above hers on the third, and found the door unlocked. 
Gene had just been eating a bowl of ice cream when Officer Geiger entered his home and shot him. He was unarmed. She was found guilty in 2019, sentenced to 10 years in prison. And most recently, the case of Breonna Taylor, a 26-year-old black woman killed by police officers who knocked down the door to her apartment in Louisville, Kentucky in 2020 while executing a drug search warrant that was later found to be flawed. Taylor's boyfriend fired a single shot that hit one of the officers as they came through the door of the apartment. Officers returned fire, striking Taylor in the apartment hallway multiple times. Former Louisville officer Brett Hackerson, who fired 10 shots into Taylor's window and glass door, found not guilty in 2022 on state charges that he endangered her neighbors when he opened fire. Grassroots organizations are sounding the alarm about Tennessee's new law allowing school teachers and other school employees to carry guns. Governor Bill Lee signed Senate Bill 1325 last month, and it took effect immediately. Danielle Smith reports. Over 450 children have lost their lives to gun violence in the U.S. this year. Kathy Barnett with Moms Demand Action predicts the new law won't enhance school safety. She notes the community worked to get an extreme risk protection order passed after the Covenant school shooting. But Republicans passed legislation this year blocking local governments from passing their own versions of these protection orders. Already we have seen the largest counties say, no, they are not going to implement it. They trust their law enforcement. They trust that they have SROs already in their schools. They feel like its dangers are just too much. Barnett adds even some of the smaller counties have said they will not implement it. Supporters of the new Tennessee law say it will make schools safer. Covenant School parent Becky Hansen cried at a House hearing when describing how her five-year-old son's teacher saved her students and said giving her a gun would have just made the situation worse. Our teacher had the wherewithal when she realized that what they thought they needed to do for a fire alarm was actually an active shooter to turn it into a race to not scare my five-year-old. There is no way that my sweet teacher could have also held and properly ejected a weapon. Barnett says over 70 percent of the parents and teachers her group surveyed don't want this law. She adds in the past 11 years of testifying before committees, some lawmakers still felt to adequately understand gun violence prevention measures. They're not listening to the research at all. And the research shows normally on the whole a mass shooter most of the time has some affiliation with that school in some way. They don't come because it's a gun free zone, which the Republicans like to say. She points out concerns that armed individuals may automatically resort to shooting, potentially harming people unintentionally, and notes a student might also gain access to a gun if there are more firearms at schools. I'm Danielle Smith. Most Californians will see a new $24 monthly charge on their electric bills late next year, or in the case of Pacific Gas and Electric customers, early in 2026. It's part of a rate shift approved by the California Public Utilities Commission today. Consumer groups are divided on how the new billing structure will affect most people. Eileen Alfredieri reports. The California Public Utilities Commission unanimously voted to change the way PG&E and other private utilities charge households for electricity. Starting in early 2026, PG&E customers will face a new fixed charge of $24.15 on their electric bills every month. The charge takes effect at the end of next year for customers of Southern California Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric. At the same time, the price of electricity per kilowatt hour will drop. PUC Commission Chair Alice Reynolds said the change is aimed at encouraging people to switch to electric appliances and electric vehicles by making each unit of electricity cheaper. And the reason customers are financially better off is because the new billing structure will reduce the price per unit of electricity by roughly 5 to 7 cents per kilowatt hour. 
This means that every time a customer plugs in their electric vehicle to a level two charger and, or dials up their electric heat pump, the price of that electricity they use will be cheaper. PUC commissioners also said it's only fair that everyone pay the fixed charge for electric transmission poles, lines, and other equipment, no matter how much electricity they use. Some consumer and environmental groups backed the change, like the Utility Reform Network known as TURN and the Natural Resources Defense Council. Others opposed it. Yvette DiCarlo spoke before the commissioners voted. I'm here on behalf of 260 nonprofit organizations opposed to the big utility tax that will increase monthly utility bills on 4 million households while doing nothing to encourage electrification or get at the root problem of rising energy costs. It simply shifts ever-rising costs around. The losers are people living in apartments and small homes who are categorically low-income while benefiting those who live in larger homes. The Environmental Working Group argued the fixed charge would end up penalizing the approximately 20 percent of Californians who use less electricity than the average rate payer. That's because the $24 fixed charge will outweigh any savings those rate payers realize in lower per unit costs of electricity. Solar advocates said the fixed charge will be another financial disincentive to investing in rooftop solar panels. Very low-income customers on the CARE or FARA plans will pay $6 and $12 monthly charges, respectively. California Senate Republicans urged the PUC not to go ahead with its vote on a new fixed charge, and some California Assembly Democrats pushed legislation to limit the monthly charge to $10. But the Democratic Assembly leader blocked a committee vote on the bill. Californians already pay among the highest electric rates in the country and have been hit with a recent series of rate hikes. More than a million PG&E customers are behind in paying their bills. I'm Eileen Alfandari for KPFA News. At its meeting earlier this week, the Richmond City Council unanimously passed a resolution to dump Pacific Gas and Electric and transition to a <coughs> non-profit public energy utility. The resolution urges the state to make a just transition from investor-owned utility, IOU, PG&E, to Golden State Energy, a not-for-profit utility for public benefit. The city's progressive mayor, Eduardo Martinez, sponsored the resolution. Supporters say it builds on existing state law passed after PG&E's 2019 bankruptcy. SB 350, the Golden State Energy Act, which authorizes the incorporation of Golden State Energy as a nonprofit public benefit corporation for the purpose of owning, controlling, operating, or managing electrical and gas services for its ratepayers and for the benefit of all Californians. The bill authorized the California Public Utilities Commission and the courts to appoint a receiver to assume possession of PG&E's property and to operate its electrical and gas systems in the case that the terms of the company's reorganization to avoid bankruptcy were not met. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA at Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. The United Nations said today that some 80,000 Palestinians had fled Israeli shelling and airstrikes in Gaza's southern city of Rafah by last night. The exodus is increasing by the hour and could be close to 100,000 by this evening. Some 1.3 million Palestinians, over half Gaza's population, had sought refuge in Rafah, there's no safe place in the Gaza Strip, said U.N. Deputy Spokesman Farhan Haq. Speaking to reporters today, he said frightened civilians are heading north to cities like Khan Yunus and Deir al-Bala, both of which lack food, shelter, and health care. The U.N. World Food Program reports its main food warehouse for Gaza, which is in Rafa, is now inaccessible. Hawk said with only one bakery in the city still working, supplies of food and fuel are running out. The U.N. Agency for Palestinian Refugees, known as UNRWA, reported that its facilities have almost no fuel today and were rationing what's left. If no fuel arrives, some hospitals should shut off their generators in three days. 
The U.N. spokesman said no aid or fuel had entered Gaza in recent days from Rafah after Israeli forces took control of the border crossing this week. Israel says it's reopened the Karem Shalom crossing. And Haq said the U.N. thinks some aid is entering Gaza, but he said both Israel and Hamas are required under international humanitarian law to ensure that aid can be delivered to people in need. And currently, that's almost impossible because of the security situation. Donna Warder has more. The sound of trucks loaded with wheat flour at the Karim Shalom crossing point on the Israeli side Thursday. The Israeli military said Wednesday it had reopened the crossing into Gaza after days of being closed following a Hamas rocket attack. But the United Nations says no humanitarian aid has yet entered and there's no one to receive it on the Palestinian side after workers fled during Israel's military incursion in the area. Another crossing nearby between Gaza and Egypt was closed by an Israeli tank brigade. Meanwhile, there's no sign of a full-scale invasion of the city of Rafah, as Israel had promised. But aid officials are warning that the prolonged closure of the two crossings could cause a collapse of aid operations, worsening the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, where the UN says a full-blown famine is already underway. I'm Donna Water. More from reporter Jody Jacobs at the United Nations in New York. More than 80,000 people have so far been displaced in Rafah, most being uprooted by Israeli military evacuation orders in eastern Rafah. This latest update from the United Nations comes as humanitarians repeat their warning about the lack of desperately needed aid in the area, despite reports that the Karim Shalom crossing near Rafah had been reopened. The world body says all key medical facilities there could soon become inaccessible. One of the three hospitals in Rafah, Al Naja, had to be abruptly vacated on Wednesday as it was located in an area subject to the evacuation order sent out by the Israeli Defense Forces. The UN has once again called for civilians in Gaza to be protected. Jody Jacobs reporting from the UN in New York. The first aid shipments headed for a U.S.-made floating port off the coast of Gaza headed out today. But the desperately needed humanitarian aid for Palestinians in Gaza will, at least for the next few days, remain sitting off the coast of Gaza on an American Navy cargo ship. As the U.S. continues to face obstacles to getting the floating pier it's constructed in place and operational in the eastern Mediterranean. The pier and causeway, known as Joint Logistics Over the Shore, or JLOTS, will ultimately be used by the U.S. and its allies and aid groups to get aid into Gaza by sea from Cyprus. But the system had, had to be moved to the port of Ashdod last week due to heavy seas, and it still hasn't left. And even when JLOTS becomes operational, the weather and sea conditions may severely limit the ability to use the floating pier. Karen Chamas has more. The first shipment of aid heading to the U.S.-built pier in Gaza has left a port in Cyprus. The U.S. vessel, loaded with much-needed humanitarian assistance, departed from the Cypriot port of Larnaca. The relief is desperately needed, as the United Nations has said northern Gaza is already in full-blown famine. Earlier this week, Israel sent tanks to seize the nearby Rafah crossing with Egypt, shutting down a vital route needed to get assistance into the battered enclave. The deputy director of the World Food Program program, Carl Scow told the AP. The situation the, the, uh, uh, of malnutrition among children is really desperate. Despite the launch of a new aid route, humanitarians say aid coming by sea won't be enough to alleviate the dire humanitarian suffering in Gaza. They say the most effective way to get assistance in is by land. I'm Karen Chamas. The United States warned today that Israel will be dealing a strategic victory to Hamas if it carries out plans for an all-out assault on Rafah. The warning was backed by a new threat from President Biden. He says he will pause more offensive military assistance to Israel if it goes through with the operation in a city where more than a million Palestinian civilians have taken shelter. 
Biden last week put on hold a shipment of large bombs to Israel over concerns the weapons are of the type that have caused significant civilian casualties in Gaza and would almost certainly do more such damage if Israel conducted a major offensive against Rafah. Yesterday, he held out the possibility of holding up future shipments of bomb guidance kits and artillery to Israel in hopes the threat would turn Israel back from an operation against the city. Christopher Martinez reports. President Joe Biden has upped the ante in his attempts to convince Israel not to invade Rafah. For the first time, he's threatening to halt some weapons shipments if Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, also known by his nickname Bibi, goes ahead with a planned invasion. Biden spoke in an interview Wednesday night on the CNN program Aaron Burnett Out Front. I've made it clear to Bibi and the War Cabinet they're not going to get our support if, in fact, they go in these population centers. We're not walking away from Israel's security. We're walking away from Israel's ability to wage war in those areas. Last week, Biden had paused shipments to Israel of 2,000-pound bombs described as high-payload unguided munitions. Israel has been bombing Rafah for weeks, and host Aaron Burnett asked Biden whether U.S. weapons have been used to kill civilians in Gaza. Civilians have been killed in Gaza as a consequence of those bombs and other ways in which they go after population centers. And I made it clear that if they go into Rafah, they haven't gone into Rafah yet, if they go into Rafah, I'm not supplying the weapons that have been used historically to deal with Rafah, to deal with the cities, to deal with that problem. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre elaborated during a press gaggle aboard Air Force One mid-flight to San Francisco. She says the U.S. will continue to send Israel defensive weapons, but she says Biden has concerns about certain types of weapons in certain kinds of operations. But she says support for Israel remains ironclad. What we do not support is a major ground operation in Rafah, a city now sheltering over one million people, since we believe there are better alternative ways to go after Hamas. Reaction from Republicans was swift. Former President Donald Trump spoke outside of a New York courthouse just before Stormy Daniels took the stand to testify in day 14 of Trump's hush money trial. Trump says what Biden has done is disgraceful. If any Jewish person voted for Joe Biden, they should be ashamed of themselves. He's uh, totally abandoned Israel, and nobody can believe it. I guess he feels good about it because he did it as a political decision. You have to do the right decision, not the political decision, but he did a very bad thing. At the nation's capital, Senate Republicans held a news conference to blast Biden's move. Senator Lindsey Graham is a Republican from South Carolina. And what do we want? We want Israel to survive and thrive. We want Hamas destroyed. We want the Palestinians to have a better future. That only happens when you're unequivocal. Now's the time, Mr. President, to send a message to all the bad guys. We're with Israel. His remarks were impassioned, but with an element of diplomacy. I'm asking you, I'm pleading with you, change course. Give Israel the weapons they need to finish this fight. Republican Senator Ted Cruz of Texas took a different tone. Let's look at our enemies. Tragically, Joe Biden has been the greatest friend the Ayatollah Khamenei has ever had on planet Earth. Tragically, Joe Biden has been the greatest friend to Hamas and Hezbollah that there is on planet Earth. Israeli officials have said their plans for Rafah will not be deterred by the Biden announcement. As for the situation in Rafah, according to the United Nations, in the past week, 80,000 people have fled the city. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. The Biden administration is condemning recent reports that Israel's ruling Likud party is threatening to retaliate against the Palestinian Authority. Should the International Criminal Court in The Hague issue arrest warrants against Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and other high-ranking officials over war crimes in the occupied Palestinian territories. The ICC is also investigating Hamas. First reported by Axios, Israel threatened to retaliate against the Palestinian Authority should arrest warrants be issued. A reporter asked U.S. State Department spokesman Matt Miller to respond. 
those comments are absolutely deplorable, um, and senior members of the Israeli government should refrain from making them. Um, we will continue to make um, our policy assessments based on what's in the best interest of the American people, what is in the best interest of the region. A handful of Republican lawmakers have sent a letter to the ICC's top prosecutor, Kareem Khan, threatening to issue severe sanctions against Khan and the court should it issue charges against Israeli officials. The Republican letter says that Target Israel, and we will target you. If you move forward with the measures indicated in the report, we will move to end all American support for the International Criminal Court, the ICC, sanction your employees and associates, and bar you and your families from the United States. You have been warned, unquote. Twelve Republicans signed that letter, including Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Ted Cruz of Texas, Marco Rubio of Florida, Tim Scott of South Carolina, who's widely seen as a potential running mate for Donald Trump. Republicans in the House are now crafting legislation to sanction the ICC, similar legislation pending in the Senate. The International Criminal Court later released a statement without pointing fingers at anyone, condemning outside pressure on its investigations. Several people have been detained by police at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology after demonstrators blocked a parking garage in their ongoing protest movement connected to the Israel-Hamas war. At MIT, protesters have been asking administrators to end all research contracts between the university with Israel's Ministry of Defense, which they estimate total $11 million since the year 2015. A group of George Washington University students were joined by two progressive Democratic members of Congress on the steps of the U.S. Capitol to denounce a police crackdown using pepper spray and clearing anti-war student protesters at attempt encampment at George Washington, arresting 33 of them. Representative Cory Bush, Democrat of Missouri, Rashida Tlaib, Democrat of Michigan. Students are protesting all across the country because they believe our government has failed to recognize the common humanity of all people. They are protesting because they oppose our government's silence and complicity in the death of at least 35,000 Palestinians. These students are saying save lives no matter faith or ethnicity. That's right. This is something that I feel like is being completely ignored. Kali, who, decided, or who declined to give her last name, is a George Washington University student. I've watched my fellow students, my close friends, be maced by police, have their hijabs ripped off, be, be thrown to the ground, have their hands zip tied to their wheelchairs, their heads smashed against bike seats so hard that their glasses cracked. And instead of resting and recuperating with them as I'd like, I'm here because Rafa is still being invaded. An Associated Press tally finds some 2,800 people have been arrested on 50 campuses across the country for protesting Israel's war in Gaza since April 18th. California State University Sacramento has reached an agreement with student anti-Gaza war protesters to divest from companies involved in genocide. The university says it's updating its socially responsible investment policy it said so in this statement, we believe it's important that our efforts to fund students' education do not rely upon us benefiting from companies that profit from ethnic cleansing, genocide, or human rights violations. Several universities have reached agreements with protesting students and heard their demands, including Brown, Evergreen, Northwestern, Rutgers, and Vassar. Not everyone in Malmö, Sweden, was welcoming the Eurovision Song Contest to town. Thousands of pro-Palestinian demonstrators protested in the Swedish port city today against Israel's participation in the pan-continental pop competition. AP correspondent Jill Lawless reports the protesters want Israel banned from the contest. Pro-Palestinian organizations have been calling for Israel to be barred and also for a ceasefire 
in the war, and they will be protesting this week. There are two large demonstrations planned. They expect thousands of people to come, not just from Sweden, but from Denmark and neighboring countries. Protesters waving green, white, black, and red Palestinian flags packed the historic square near Malmo's 16th century town hall before a planned march through the city for a rally in a park several miles from the Eurovision venue. Police estimated that between 10 and 12,000 people took part. Among those in the crowd was Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg. The Israel-Hamas war, which has killed almost 35,000 Palestinians, has brought a jarring juxtaposition to Eurovision week in Malmo. Music fans in colorful sequined outfits or draped in their national flags are mixing in the streets with supporters of the Palestinian cause. Palestinian flags fly from windows and balconies along a thoroughfare that's been temporarily renamed Eurovision Street. A smaller pro-Israel protest was also held today in a central Malmo square. Contest organizers who try to keep Eurovision a non-political event have rejected calls to bar Israel over the conduct of its war against Hamas. But critics of the decision to let Israel compete point out that Russia was kicked out of Eurovision in 2022 after its full-scale invasion of Ukraine and Belarus was ejected a year earlier over its government's crackdown on dissent. Pro-Palestinian groups plan to march again on Saturday, the day of the Eurovision final. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. And boy, am I in trouble because this is day three of the Fun drive here at KPFA, and I have gone two-thirds of the way through the newscast tonight without trying to raise any money to keep this radio station on the air, which is how this newscast gets broadcast. In fact, I have not raised a penny to keep this newscast on the air. So in the final 19 minutes of the newscast, I'm desperately seeking your help. Get me off the hook here. Get me off the hook. I'm supposed to raise $1,700 in this newscast, and I am at $0 right now. I do have a challenge from Paul in Larkspur, who will make a matching amount of $375 to help us get to that $1,700 goal. That means your contribution will be worth double if we're able to get an aggregate amount of supporters to the tune of a total of $375 worth of support. 1-800-439-5732 is the number to call. If you get something of value from this newscast and from the news and information that this radio station provides 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, if you get something of value from the muse and cultural programming, the music and cultural programming that this station also broadcasts, please help us out because we are listener-sponsored. That's the way we've done it for 75 years and would like to do it for another year at least, but can only do it with your financial support. Go online at kpfa.org kpfa.org, or give us a call, 1-800-439-5732. Now you say, why don't I take the rest of this newscast and just keep begging, asking for your financial support? Lord, I wish I could, but I can't, because it's my primary job is to bring you the news, and I still have lots of news to bring to you. So here's my plight. I went too long without trying to raise any money. Therefore, I have raised no money. Therefore, I am in deep doo-doo and need your financial support to stand on. 1-800-439-5732, kpfa.org. One more time before I return to the news. 1-800-439-5732. We're in a matching period. Thanks to Paul in Larkspur. Your contribution worth doubled if we're able to get to that matching amount. one 800 439 Five seven three two or kpfa.org. 
In Washington, the U.S. Senate today held a hearing on junk fees in the financial services and rental housing industries. Junk fees are the hidden fees tacked on to consumers' credit card and other bills and on to rents. Max Springle has the story. The Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs took up the junk fees issue Thursday, calling it a growing tactic used by the financial services and rental housing industries to fleece customers. Democratic Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown chairs the committee. These are surprise, although not that much of a surprise anymore, often last-minute charges that drive up the cost of products have no justification or connection to anything other than their quest for profits. Senator Brown said lower listed prices and rents are often advertised to lure customers. And that's, he says, when companies start tacking on the extra costs. Let's say you're looking for an apartment, you finally find one with affordable rent. But when you get a look at the lease, you realize that between the maintenance fee and the trash fee and the mysterious convenience fee, the actual rent you'll be charged each month is out of your budget now. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has proposed a new rule that would cap credit card late fees at $8. A conservative group is challenging the rule in court. It's estimated the rule would save 45 million Americans $10 billion annually in predatory fees. Republican Ohio Senator J.D. Vance said the CFPB's rule would have the unintended consequence of limiting low-income people's access to credit. This proposal will inevitably lead to less credit options for lower-income people. And I wish its advocates would just lean into that and say, yeah, that's exactly what it's going to do. In fact, we think that's a good thing as opposed to sort of hiding from the fact that it will mean less consumer credit for low-income people. Santiago Suero with the consumer advocacy group Financial Health Network told the panel that junk fees and hidden fees are disproportionately targeted toward low-income consumers and people of color. We just did a survey where we found that 40% of all Latinos had paid a junk fee. This is much higher than other groups. 25% of Latinos had paid a credit card late fee, which is also much higher than other groups. So it's, it's widespread. It's disproportionately affecting people who don't have a lot of income. An analysis released earlier this year by Accountable.us found that rental giants Invitation Homes and AMH made a combined $953 million in profit in 2023. That's a 37% increase from the year before, derived largely from rent hikes and excessive fees. For KPFA News, I'm Max Pringle. In the North Bay town of Larkspur, tenants and labor advocates say they've submitted more than enough signatures to place a rent control measure on the city's ballot this November. City Council has imposed rent control at 7 percent. Advocates say their plan would lower that cap on how much one can raise the rent each year to 3 percent. Joan Weinberg is a renter in Larkspur, where she's lived for 30 years. She says she'd like to stay, but high rents are making it difficult with a new corporate landlord at the Skylark complex where she lives. I can't afford 10%, 8.5%, nor even 7%, which is what the city council voted in. So we are attempting and we've got all the signatures for it, to have a cap of 3%. And we hope for the best. I will not be able to stay here even at 7%. I'm a senior, and I'm on Social Security and a small retirement. A coalition of the North Bay Labor Council, the Skylark, and Bon Air Tenant Associations, the Marin Democratic Socialists of America, and community members submitted more than 1,100 signatures to qualify a rent control measure for the November ballot. The campaign surpassed the minimum number of signatures needed to qualify, and if at least 910 of those signatures are determined valid by the county clerk, The measure will secure a spot on the November 2024 ballot. And before I move on, and there's still a lot of news to move on to, 
thanks to four of you who have become donors to our matching fund tonight. Thanks to listeners in San Francisco and Oakland Forest in San Jose and Tom in Springfield, Oregon. But we've still got a long way to go in order to make our $375 matching fund. So please go to your telephone or pick up your telephone and give us a call at 1-800-439-5732. Or you can do it online at kpfa.org. 1-800-439-5732. Or online at kpfa.org. I got a very late start trying to raise the amount of money that I need to raise to keep this newscast on the air. So please help me out. 1-800-439-5732, kpfa.org. Ahead of Mother's Day this weekend, homeless rights advocates and their supporters called on San Francisco officials to do more to assist homeless mothers and their families. KPFA's Zen Iqbal was there at their rally today and filed this report. A group of about 50 demonstrators made their case at City Hall Thursday urging the mayor and the Board of Supervisors not to make cuts in this year's budget that would impact housing and other services. Tina Collins is a case manager for the Workforce Development Nonprofit Code Tenderloin. She said her team recently tried to secure services for several pregnant homeless women, but were turned down because of a lack of shelter space. And so we ran across five pregnant women within the last two weeks. And every time we tried to get them services, they didn't have them. They didn't have a bed for them. They didn't have the Lily Project come to them. They told them to go into a, um, a drop-in day. So it's very urgent that we get these extra funds for shelter beds, for people can be placed as soon as they come in. The Coalition on Homelessness estimates that over 400 families are waiting for emergency shelter in San Francisco. The group says that it's due in part to the city's understaffed and underfunded homeless services. Sandra Sandoval is director of the Young Women's Freedom Center. It's a group that supports young women, girls, and transgender people who are dealing with poverty or have spent time in the criminal justice or foster care systems. She said young mothers often face difficult choices at the end of the month. And our young mothers, they can't make ends meet. Right now, some of them that may be in public systems, food stamps is not getting them for the end of, to the end of the month. We have to make decisions. Does money go to rent or does it go to food? Why should we have to pick from two things that are basic human rights? Being able to eat and being able to have roof over our heads. District 5 Supervisor Dean Preston called on the activists to continue their fight for secure housing. He said city leadership's claims that there's no money for services in the budget aren't true. They will tell you that you're being unrealistic to say no cuts and you're being unrealistic. And I say that is not being unrealistic when we have 50,000 units sitting empty, when we have buildings that we could buy, and when we have billionaires, literal billionaires in this city, let's do what it takes to make sure no family, no mother is living on the streets of San Francisco and everyone has a safe, decent place to call home. Among other cuts, Mayor London Breed's budget proposal includes a 50% reduction to San Francisco's Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Sharda Johnson is a case manager for Jelani House, which provides transitional housing to young mothers. She said housing cuts have a wide-ranging impact on the city's most vulnerable. So they're cutting the housing costs. That means that moms will not have accessibility to help with their rental assisting or low-income housing or anything like that. Also, that will, that will interfere with the transitional housing and the shelter bids and things like that that we have for single mom and homeless moms. We already don't have enough, so we don't want them to cut anything. The mayor will submit her proposed budget to the Board of Supervisors and for public hearings on June 1st, with a final budget due on July 1st. Activists say they will continue to press their case until then. I'm Zenek Ball, reporting for KPFA. Trouble, 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 nothing but a world of trouble. We're down to our last five minutes, and there is no one on the line right now. 
We have had six donors towards our matching fund, thanks to a listener in San Francisco and thanks to Nora in Bandon, Oregon. Thank you very much, but we are so far behind. I can't even stop to think about it. All I can do is give you the numbers so you can help me out if you can help me out. 1-800-439-5732. And if you've got some spare change, you can help me out. 1-800-439-5732 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org. Governor Gavin Newsom today threatened the city of Half Moon Bay with legal action if city officials continue to delay a planned 40-unit housing project for migrant workers. The call comes more than a year after seven local farm workers were killed in a mass shooting that exposed deplorable living conditions at some farms along the coast. Last week, the city's planning commission, citing concerns about the project's design, voted to push back a decision on an affordable housing complex. The developer has said that if project plans aren't finalized soon, could mean losing out on the public funding needed to start construction on the $43 million project. TikTok has sued to block the law that would force the application to be divested from its Chinese-based parent company, ByteDance, or be banned from the U.S. In a lawsuit filed against the U.S. government, TikTok and ByteDance argue the law, the Protecting Americans from Foreign Adversaries Act, violates the First Amendment. Heya Panjwani reports. TikTok and its Chinese parent company are suing the United States. Citing the law as unconstitutional, TikTok and its parent company, ByteDance, are suing the federal government to challenge a law that would force the sale of ByteDance's stake or face a ban. The law was signed in April by President Joe Biden as part of a larger $95 billion foreign aid package. The measure requires ByteDance to sell TikTok within nine months. Lawmakers from both parties have expressed concerns that Chinese authorities could force ByteDance to hand over U.S. user data or sway public opinion by manipulating the algorithm that populates users' feeds. Opponents of the law argue that Chinese authorities could easily get information on Americans in other ways. Kaya Panjwani, Washington. Thanks to a listener to KPFA from San Jose who called in their financial support. Actually, they did it online at kpfa.org. But in the final two minutes here, I'm still short and there's no one on the line 1-800-439-5732, kpfa.org. Authorities interrupted rescue efforts in flood-ravaged southern Brazil amid more rain and the risk of lightning and stiff winds that threatened to exacerbate a catastrophe. It's already killed at least 100 people and left over 163,000 seeking shelter. Karen Chamas reports. New storms are approaching southern Brazil as it continues to reel from massive flooding. The southern city of Porto Alegre is engulfed with flood water. Authorities in southern Brazil rushed to rescue survivors of the massive flooding that has killed at least 100 people. More than 230,000 people have been displaced and much of the region has been isolated by floodwaters. Dozens of displaced people have crowded into a warehouse in Porto Alegre for shelter from the floods. 68-year-old Heitor da Silva told the AP, I only took my documents, three shirts, two underwear and my flip-flops. All the rest is gone. Climate scientist Alvaro da Silva says climate change is to blame. This is what happens when we have uh, 1.2 degrees Celsius uh, warmer uh, world than in pre-industrial time. I'm Karen Chamas. I'm officially opening the meeting of the last minute club for all you procrastinators out there. This is the meeting of the last minute, the last 50 seconds. No one on the line right now. 1-800-439-5732. Thanks to an anonymous listener from Richmond for your contribution. As we try to close out this matching fund successfully here in the final 30 seconds, 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org. Sunny tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area with highs in the mid-70s around the bay. A little warmer inland with highs in the upper 80s. Highs in the low 90s in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow under sunny skies. 
That's it for the news tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. For 75 years, KPFA has presented progressive voices who spoke truth to power. Paul Robeson. I have in the studio with me Paul Robeson, who needs no introduction. I wonder, Mr. Robeson, if we could kick off by asking, when did you first become involved in the <laughs> political aspects of... May I first say how happy I am and privileged to be with you here and how deeply I thank uh, this station for its kindness throughout the years. I entered the arena in the United States of fighting for social justice for my people when I was in a concert in St. Louis in 1947. And the NAACP asked me in St. Louis at that time to come on a picket line because Negro people could not even sit in the theater, which was just across the street. I said that I was giving up my career technically for the moment to enter the realm of the day-to-day -day struggle of the Negro people. 94.1 FM, 75 years of building community trust. Support us today at kpfa.org.